tonight, killed in the line of duty, an Ontario police officer shot while responding to a call. So it happened literally doors down from us, which is really terrifying. Worries about yet another attack described as an ambush. A provincial wildfire emergency during a provincial election campaign. Communities wonder if they are the top priority. Some of them are out still campaigning. We need those people back to work. The frantic crush at the U.S.-Mexico border as U.S. asylum rules turn tougher. We don't know what's coming in the next day. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. It is a tragedy that's happened with alarming frequency recently. And tonight, a small community in Ontario joins others in trying to come to terms with it. The death of a police officer killed in the line of duty. Now, police say Ontario Provincial Police Sergeant Eric Mueller was ambushed when he and two of his colleagues responded to a call sent to serve. They became the victims. The suspect has been arrested, but the village of Bourget has never seen this level of violence before. As Natalia Goodwin shows us, this has left residents shaken. This normally quiet country road, suddenly a scene of intense police activity. Hours earlier, around 2 a.m., three of their own had been shot. Our officers responded to a sound of gunshots that was reported by a citizen. And upon arrival, three of our officers were ambushed and shot. 42-year-old Sergeant Eric Mueller, a veteran of 21 years on the force, was killed. Eric was an exemplary officer, a family man. His colleagues describe him as a mentor and someone everyone looked up to. The glue that held his shift together, the best leader that many people ever had the privilege of working for. Two other experienced officers were taken to hospital. One was released and is recovering at home. The other remains in stable condition. Everything was right outside kind of our front door, so it happened literally just doors down from us, um, which is really terrifying. It's incredibly shocking uh, because in, in our community, you know, this has never happened before, but that doesn't mean that it's... Uh, uh, that it's any different than, than whatever municipality that it happens in, whether it happens in Toronto or it happens here. The death was marked by both federal and provincial politicians. In Ontario, a moment of silence in the legislature. And in Ottawa, words of support from the Prime Minister. It has happened far too often over the past many months across this country that we've lost police officers in the line of duty, serving their community. 39-year-old Alain Belfoy was arrested on scene just down this road. Police say he has been charged with one count of first-degree murder and two counts of attempted murder. He is due back in court May 18th. Natalia Goodwin, CBC News, Bourget, Ontario. The death of Sergeant Mueller has come with a renewed call for action, in part because his killing continues an alarming trend. But as Thomas Degla shows us, while many agree there is a problem, few have come to terms with a solution. With 10 officers killed in the line of duty since last fall, it's been an especially deadly period for Canadian police, leaving colleagues shaken. It was quite emotional uh, this morning uh, for all of us. And uh, uh, I heard quite a few times the, uh, the words, when's this going to stop? Statistics Canada has been tracking homicides against police for seven decades, with the highest count in 1962, when 10 officers were killed across the country. Through the 2010s, there was on average about one police death a year. Now, with the killing of Ontario Provincial Police Sergeant Eric Mueller, 2023 is on track to be the worst year on record. We're trying to resolve these problems with Band-Aids. And when the Band-Aids fall off, violence is a heightened possibility. Just this past weekend, Ontario held a special ceremony to honour recently fallen officers. Most of them killed in ambush-style attacks. Like Constable Andrew Hong, targeted near Toronto last September while on a break at a coffee shop. Weeks later, Constable Greg Pershala was shot and killed, responding to a vehicle in a ditch. I've been working with the Minister of Public Safety and with 
uh, the Minister of Justice to see what more we can do to keep them safe, but this has to stop. Trouble is, there's little consensus about what needs fixing most urgently, from concerns about the justice system to calls for more mental health support. Ontario is focusing first on bail reform. We can't have uh, our, our police officers losing their lives, being ambushed, and literally ambushed. It's uh, unacceptable. This Ontario police memorial bears hundreds of names of fallen officers. Now there will be another one added to the wall and more questions about how this could have been prevented. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Victims of sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces are now eligible for legal assistance. Discrimination, sexual harassment and inequality have absolutely no place in the Canadian Armed Forces. So complainants will be reimbursed legal costs dating back to April of 2019 through a new independent program. That is one of the 48 recommendations former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour tabled last year. Her report highlighted the force's failure to deal with sexual misconduct. And now to the U.S. southern border where people are flocking to crossing points. Title 42, that's a pandemic era immigration policy, is set to expire. It allowed authorities to turn people away with new rules imminent an unprecedented surge of those hoping to cross is expected to become even bigger. Even though the new rules carry with them their own hardship. Katie Simpson is at the border in El Paso, Texas, where an already strained system is at risk of being overwhelmed. The lineups at border wall gates never seem to ease. U.S. authorities work quickly, apprehending thousands of people during the final hours of Title 42. These migrants are hoping and praying they made the right call to seek asylum now rather than waiting for the rules to change. We are a nation of immigrants and a nation of laws. We are doing everything possible to enforce those laws in a safe, orderly and humane way. Title 42 is being replaced by a pre-pandemic immigration policy called Title 8. Rather than expelling migrants quickly, it grants asylum seekers a meeting with authorities to make a case they face a credible safety threat. A pass means a person can start the immigration process. A fail leads to deportation and a ban on entering the U.S. for at least five years. However, the risk of a ban doesn't appear to be much of a deterrent. Tens of thousands of migrants have already gathered in northern Mexican border communities. We don't know what's coming in the next day. We don't know what's coming in the next 10 days. So family units will stay together, and then if, there's, if we happen to get any single males, they have a... In El Paso, an unused school is being turned into a temporary shelter for migrants making travel plans to meet family elsewhere. Some migrants with no place to go will continue to be sent north. Another bus arrived at the vice president's residence in Washington, D.C., a controversial move by Republican governors who want Democratic lawmakers to deal with the crisis. In border communities, donations fill the gaps where resources have run out. Migrants try to remain hopeful amid the confusion and change. I want to take my granddaughter to college and watch her grow here, says Angel, a Venezuelan migrant. I want everyone to know I would fight and die for this country. So, Katie, you're at that border wall. I know you've seen hundreds of migrants be detained. How much more space is there in the immigration system to handle asylum seekers? Adrian, the system right now is so severely overwhelmed. Border Patrol has about 28,000 people in custody. That's about 10,000 more than the system is actually meant to handle. When it comes to the immigration court proceedings, there's a case backlog of about 2 million. This is something that Democrats and Republicans actually agree on. Both sides say that the immigration system is broken. But because they both differ so severely on how to go about changing things and fixing things, Nothing actually seems to ever change. All right, Katie Simpson, thank you. Thanks. Now to Alberta, where the already intense wildfire season is about to get wilder. The scope of this crisis is already unprecedented, but in the next few days, the risk of wildfire danger is forecast to quickly spread through most of the province, driven by rising temperatures. Today, Canadian Armed Forces touched down on a mission to support firefighters 
and help with airlifts. This as the province faces criticism over its support and the possible distraction of an election campaign. Julia Wong shows us who's speaking out. Wildfires are scorching Yellowhead County west of Edmonton. It went into trees and went, you know, 200 feet in the air. And with hotter weather on the way, there's concern. The temperature goes up and wind goes up. A single ember can cause a huge problem. All of this in the midst of a provincial election. Local officials are openly asking whether the provincial government is focused on the disaster. This mayor says the state of emergency should have happened earlier and says he spent days trying to reach anyone in government who could help issue fire bans or an ATV ban. Alberta is uh, in a crisis right now and we need to be focused on that all levels of government. We're having a hard time getting enough equipment in here to deal with it. The elected officials are out. Um, some of them are out still campaigning. In my mind, we need those people back to work. Among those campaigning Thursday, UCP leader Danielle Smith, who made an unrelated pledge to help seniors deal with inflation. In a statement to CBC News, her office says responding to the unprecedented wildfire situation is the top priority for the Premier and Cabinet. To insinuate otherwise is ridiculous, adding Smith remains fully briefed on the situation. Let's be very clear, this is extraordinary, this type of weather event is not, is nor, it has a, a less than 1% chance of happening in any given year. 300 Canadian Armed Forces members have arrived in Alberta. They'll be deployed to three communities, helping with firefighting efforts, airlift and engineering support. But the province remains in a highly volatile and rapidly changing environment. That's particularly true with the rising temperatures in the forecast this weekend. Everything we planned for 40 years is gone. For some who have returned home, the gravity of the situation is sinking in. We don't have a government that looks after things. They don't believe in balancing budget. And that's why I'm in such a pickle, because I decided I had to balance my budget and I didn't do insurance, which was dumb. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot to deal with, and it sounds like things aren't getting any better, are they, Julia? What's in the forecast? So, Adrian, temperatures have slowly been warming up. And look around me, you can see that the ground is still smoldering after wildfire ripped through here. Now, these fires are burning so deep. All you need are hot temperatures and gusty conditions to wake what some are calling the sleeping giant. And that is exactly what is forecast for the next few days, which is not good news for thousands of Albertans who are still out of their homes with no word on when they can go back. All right, Julia Wong, thank you. King Charles and Queen Camilla expressed their concern today for those suffering losses from the wildfires. We hold many fond memories of our visits to Western Canada, said the King, and know that those affected will rise to this challenge with customary Canadian strength, resilience and determination. The federal government plans to table a foreign agents registry bill later this year. This comes in the same week that Canada expelled the diplomat from China Following reports, he tried to target an MP's family. China then retaliated, expelling a Canadian diplomat from Shanghai. All of this amid scrutiny of the Liberal government over what it knew and when about China's alleged election interference. And Ottawa has unveiled new measures aimed at forcing national sports organizations to be more transparent and more responsive to athletes. Jamie Strash and why critics say the changes just don't go far enough. We're also going to have uh, an athlete council working directly with Sport Canada. So For years, Canadian athletes have implored leaders to listen to their thoughts and concerns. I think every athlete wants is their voice to be heard. Now, in order to receive federal funding, national sport organizations will have to include at least one athlete on their boards. This is really something that is going to force those national sport organizations that haven't done it yet to, um, to open their eyes. The announcement also includes rules about financial transparency, but it doesn't deal with a central concern, the abuse of athletes. There were many nights where I felt broken beyond repair. I was not broken by sport, I was abused in sport and broken by the system. MPs heard from athletes from nearly a dozen sports, including gymnastics and soccer. Also announced the end of non-disclosure agreements, which have prevented some athletes from sharing their stories. St. Ange says these moves are a beginning. I wish there was one solution that, that could 
over a day change the culture in sport, but unfortunately it's not the way it works. What many have been calling for is an immediate judicial inquiry into abuse in Canadian sport. It's disheartening to think that how many survivors have come forward, how many advocates come forward for talking about a, an inquiry and, and demanding an inquiry, and they haven't been engaged. St. Ange insists she is listening to what she calls extremely shocking stories of abuse. I've already committed to bringing a, a national inquiry. Uh, it's a matter of time. I'm still working on it. When I'm ready to announce it, we will. But the announcement so far doesn't address the hundreds of thousands of Canadian children playing sports at the local level. Ongoing CBC News investigation shows there is serious abuse happening there and limited action to stop it. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. To Ukraine now, where, according to one Russian military leader, Kyiv's counteroffensive is underway. Now, while that may not be clear, based solely on reports on the ground, there are some signs worth noting. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said a counteroffensive launch now would take unacceptable losses, that preparations need more time. What to make then of reports Ukraine has turned the table somewhat in, of all places, Bakhmut. One of those reports coming from the head of Russia's mercenary Wagner Group. Maybe not full swing, but for weeks, Ukraine has been hitting Russia's supply lines, an oil depot here, a rail line there. Dashes of destruction that may have just gotten a boost from Britain. Today I can confirm that the UK is donating Storm Shadow missiles to Ukraine. Those are cruise missiles able to strike farther than anything Kyiv had before, including right into Russian territory. And in Turkey, a potentially momentous election is just days away now. Voters could oust the party that has held power for more than two decades. As Briar Stewart shows us, anger towards the government has been rising. They're chanting potatoes, onions. Erdogan's got to go. A complaint about the cost of living and rallying cry for an energized opposition. Spring will come to Turkey because we're going to change a totalitarian regime through democracy, said the man who could be Turkey's next president. Kemal Kilic Deroglu is leading an alliance of six opposition parties. Supporters believe he will defeat Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's been in power for 20 years. What is this election about for you? It's about me everything because it's, it's going to make, affect my future. We have to change our president. It's estimated that 5 million young people will be eligible to vote for the first time in this election. For many of them, like other generations, the biggest issue now is the economy. In this ad, Kilic Darolu used the skyrocketing price of an onion to attack Erdogan's monetary policy. And it resonates in a country where the official inflation rate is 45%. At this market, shoppers told us they can only afford to buy a fraction of the groceries they used to. I'm 80 years old and I've never seen such high prices. We should change this, said this woman. This pastry seller agrees it's hard to raise his family on the equivalent of $600 a month. But he believes it's Erdogan who's still the best choice. Everyone votes for the person they feel closest to ideologically, he says. The conservative president and his AK party still have broad support, even in the southeast, which was devastated by February's earthquake. Throughout the country, one concern has been that in centralizing so much power in the presidency, Erdogan has eroded democratic institutions. The freedom of media and freedom of thought has been suppressed. Opposition, um, political actors uh, have suffered uh, from the autocratic rule. But by joining forces, the opposition is emboldened. So, so good in future in Turkey. So Briar, Sunday is when voters head to the polls. What can we expect to see? 
Well, the latest polling suggests that Kirish Daulu is leading Erdogan by about five percentage points, but that gap has likely widened now, and that's because another opposition candidate has just announced that he's dropping out of the race. Now, if come Sunday no candidate receives more than 50 percent of the vote, there will be a second round, and that will take place in two weeks' time. All right, Briar Stewart and our team in Istanbul. Thanks, Briar. You're welcome. Nearly eight months after Hurricane Fiona slammed into Atlantic Canada, some are still waiting for help. We lost part of our roof, but uh, we were lucky. Uh, our next door neighbors, not so lucky. One community struggled to rebuild. The political fallout of a diplomatic expulsion. This is a decision we took seriously. We took with careful consideration. Rosie is here with that issue. And a New Brunswick family gets a wild surprise. After an hour and a half, I said to my husband, well, maybe it's better not bother him. We are back in two. A labor dispute at Canada's largest cemetery has compounded the grief of bereaved families. For months, hundreds of bodies have remained in storage with workers demanding better wages. Alison Northcott with calls for a resolution and the respite offered for Mother's Day only. Almost every day, Jimmy Koliakoudakis rides his motorcycle to the closed gates of the Notre Dame des Neiges Cemetery. He's been waiting months for it to reopen so he can say a proper goodbye to his mother, Penelope. The horrible thing that is happening is that my mother is in cold storage or a freezer, uh, for lack of a better word. And uh, uh, we're at a standstill. That's because since January, the cemetery has mostly been off limits, with graveside visits and burials on hold as workers here strike over pay and staffing levels. It's really um, workers' matter. Um, we're unable to sustain or to maintain the quality of the services. Notre Dame des Neiges is the largest cemetery in the country, where nearly a million people are laid to rest, including notable Quebecers like Maurice Richard. But with employees on the picket lines, work like digging graves and maintaining the grounds has slowed to a crawl. 250 bodies are in cold storage waiting for burial. Adding to that, a recent ice storm caused extensive damage, and the debris still isn't cleared. This is my mom at the old age home. For grieving families, it makes things even harder. Uh, I don't want my mom to think that, you know, we just put her aside for now. I want her to know that we're trying our best and we're trying to get her the last uh, dignity that she deserves. The cemetery's managers have heard the pleas from families and will allow visitors on Sunday for Mother's Day, but only for a few hours in areas where it's safe. Quebec's Labour Minister says mediators are trying to resolve the dispute and says he's putting pressure on both sides to come to an agreement. It's a private conflict and I cannot legislate to, uh, to order a bank to work. For Koliakoudakis, he just hopes the strike ends soon so he can finally bury his mother next to his late father. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Parts of Atlantic Canada are still in tatters nearly eight months after Hurricane Fiona wreaked havoc on the region. Kayla Hounsel shows us some grim images from one of the hardest hit communities. Around here, heroes have hammers. Volunteer Mennonites from all over the country here to help put this community back together. I got emotional. I, you just don't have someone to walk over and say, hey, I see you guys are in a very bad situation here. We're going to help fix that for you. Sean Casey's home suffered significant damage when Fiona crashed ashore last September. That window got broken. Uh, we lost siding over here. This is Glace Bay on Cape Breton Island, where it's windy on a good day. And Fiona's fury is still evident all over the place. We lost part of our roof and uh, the whole roof was compromised, but uh, we were lucky. Uh, our next door neighbors, not so lucky. The Casey's neighbors were out of the country visiting family during the storm. Their house used to be right here where I'm standing, but the Casey's had to call them and tell them they probably shouldn't come back for a while because their home was gone. We said, well, there's no point, there's nothing here. Your house is condemned. 
Dozens of homes still haven't been rebuilt or repaired, either because the owners are still fighting for insurance, disaster relief promised by governments in the wake of the storm hasn't arrived, or there's no one to do the work due to a shortage of contractors. It's definitely not over. We're st we still got calls again this morning from people looking for help. The United Way has been trying to coordinate help, compounding the problem, a long-term housing shortage. It's desperate here. So there was no place else for these folks to go, so they lived in it. They lived in their homes with the mold and the wet and everything else around them. And water get into this area here. Joe Spencer lost his roof and lived in his house without one until the Mennonites arrived. And how would you have gotten your roof fixed if they didn't come do it? I have no idea. None whatsoever. They say they're coming back to fix his ceilings, walls and windows. Relief for some, but so many more are still waiting after what has already been a long time living on edge. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. After the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight, an expelled diplomat and now the promise of a foreign registry to deal with interference and influence from China. We'll take um, whatever action is necessary to continue to protect our democracy. But how are the government's efforts affecting Canada's position on the world stage? Chantal, Althea, Andrew and Jason Markusoff join me to talk about that and more. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. After weeks of allegations, Canada has expelled a Chinese diplomat accused of targeting Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family overseas. This is a decision we took seriously, we took with careful consideration uh, in order to, uh, to do the right thing and uh, expel the, uh, the Chinese diplomat. This comes as the government confirms foreign agent registry legislation is finally on its way. A foreign agent's registry is going to be implemented uh, in the coming months. So let's bring in our panelists, Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and joining us this week, this week Jason Markasov. Good to see everybody. Um, Chantal, I'm going to start with you. It, it, I guess one of the things people were wondering when Canada finally made this decision to expel a, a diplomat was, is this a, a sign that the government is reactive or proactive in its foreign policy response? And, and was it ultimately the right call? I think most people watching from the outside would be hard pressed to call it proactive <laughs> considering that they were kind of dragged to the realization that uh, this had happened, uh, that they had not somehow let it fall through the cracks and then needed to take action. I'm not going after them on the notion that it took X number of days because sure. I do understand that in other G7 countries it is the practice to give China or others uh, the option of moving their uh, diplomat away before he or she is declared persona non grata. And usually you give them a couple of days, uh, not just two hours to decide. So I think that was part of, uh, uh, and parcel of the decision. But beyond that, uh, no, I, I think they've been reactive. They have been slow to realize that this issue had legs uh, and they've been in reactive mode and sometimes with a delay ever since this debate started. Andrew? Uh, what's that line of Churchill's about the Americans? They can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. <laughs> uh, that's what we seem to be getting here. We, eventually they come around to the decision to establish a foreign agent registry is, is eventually maybe we might have a public inquiry eventually maybe we'll find out what on earth was going on inside uh, those high offices when these stream of intelligence reports were coming up to them uh, warning about what China was up to but it always seems to take them uh, um, a long time and they seem very reluctant and unwilling it's fine I, I understand Chantel's point about you know diplomatic niceties leave them time to, to get out on their own steam but we've got some yards to make up with China. They have been running us ragged for some time. They have been interfering in our politics at every level. Uh, they have been intimidating our citizens. They've recently been caught red-handed intimidating one of our MPs. At that point, I think you need to be a little bit less uh, tactful uh, and a little bit more brusque with them. We need to, if I can borrow a phrase, make an example here. Uh, and to be spending a week publicly agonizing over what China might do in response, basically you might as well take out, take out an ad saying we can be intimidated. 
And, and I wonder, Althea, how that is viewed not only by China, by, but by allies or, or, or other countries in the world, that, that it would take us some time to, to do all the things that Andrew's talking about. <clears throat> Um, well, I don't know. I don't. I haven't called uh, the <laughs> inner workings of the capitals around the world, but yeah. from the media coverage, yeah. Uh, yeah. you get the sense that there is obviously interest uh, because it has made the news uh, in other countries, in the U.S. and the U.K. notably. Um, I think Andrew raises an interesting point in, in kind of separating, um, and I don't know if he meant to do this or not, but as a foreign policy issue and a domestic policy issue, because right. the reason that the government was forced to respond on the Michael Chong stuff was became because it became a domestic political issue, became a hot issue domestically, not because they had this like come to Jesus moment mm -hmm. about uh, foreign policy, because if so, it would have been, you know, more than one diplomat likely. There would have been a policy response to it. And, and it wasn't that. It was very reactive. And we talked about this last week. But um, if we you know, yank the credentials of seven Russian diplomats because of one Russian ex-spy being poisoned in the UK, it's kind of odd that we would just send one person packing in this case. Jason. I mean, I don't think there was any uh, Liberal Party uh, official who was boasting that this was a proactive uh, move. Uh, you know, forget the week, uh, one week delay. Uh, this is, a, what, two years after the, uh, the offending act? occurred that this is a uh, that this is being responded to um, it's not like anybody in the uh, government is also saying you know we are now enacting uh, the first tranche or the second tranche or tranche whatever of our indo-pacific st uh, strategy exactly um, this was you know in response uh, to something that happened two years ago that as Althea says is now attracting heat and um, uh, you know Canada will re re seems to remain cautious they're not putting in when they do talk about putting in their uh, Foreign agent registry. They're going to do it after consultation, after uh, you know some legislative process, and uh, who knows when we're actually going to see uh, anybody actually having to register. And okay. they announced it a year yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah the, yeah, the foreign agent yeah. registry. It only took all of these stories for them to actually go ahead and, uh, and get it yeah, moving. Yeah, well, Chantal. this is the government that's known for months that it would need a new RCMP commissioner. And here we are with an interim uh, on the on the, the uh, allies looking at us. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the story that's consuming us is China interference. But the story of interest to many of our allies is that leaky ceases um, and an accumulation of leaks to the newspapers. And why is that? Because a lot of countries are not too keen to share intelligence with the sieve. And the impression from the outside is that we have a security service that is leaking left, right, and center. And that is a more major concern, I would argue, to many allies uh, than the issue of Chinese interference that they all are keeping an eye on. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Andrew. Well, maybe not Chinese interference, but there is certainly a realignment going on around the world where people are taking very clear lines that we have to contain China, that we cannot view it as merely a competitor anymore. It is an adversary. Uh, and it's going to be definitely of interest in other capitals uh, where and, and how what, what Canada's prepared to do in that regard. Mm -hmm. So if the reason that these leaks have been coming is that we have been signaling failing to do anything on this regard, that the government had been so committed to basically bet the farm on this overture to China in the early years of, of this government and has been, I think, reluctant to kind of admit that it had failed, uh, then I think that's also of interest to foreign capitals. I, I agree that the point that nobody likes seeing secrets being leaked. But I think the reasons uh, why these were being leaked is probably also of interest to foreign capitals. And also what the retaliation will be from China. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but it's still, hard to imagine bottom, it's just but, it for tat. But bottom line, it is as damaging to Canada's reputation, mm -hmm. the perception that our security services are leaking and leaky, as it is that we are not proactive on issues that have engaged our allies. Just, Both just a, yeah. come at a price. Just about a minute, Althea, but I mean, the Indo-Pacific strategy, to, to Jason's point, is in part, at least, in response to China uh, and, and the things that Andrew's talking about there. And, and that policy itself talked about how China was increasingly disruptive. Yeah, but it's many years late, much like the government's realization that China poses a much bigger threat than they first expected. Right. And I think that's where, like, the, the blind blind spots are like when you go through who knew what and when and yes government set the tone and now that the prime minister has said i want to know everything everything should come to my desk 
uh, you know, that's important. But it's also important that the public service take the issue seriously. And so it's it's odd. Yes, I know, according to the reports, you know, there were no d necessarily uh, a named MP in that report. Yeah. And the allegations were a little bit vague. But if you're the national security advisor and you think that this is very important, even though you go, your you know replacement comes in and, and that person goes on vacation and somebody <laughs> else is acting, there is still yeah. a, an expectation that one would take this seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is, you know, speaks to the fact that foreign policy actually is not treated that seriously in the, this country. Culture. We are yeah. very focused on uh, inward looking domestic policies, social policy, and these things are, We've known about them. We, we put them on the very far back burner and hope that nothing erupts, so we have to, to deal with it. I'm going to take a short break. Jason, you'll start us off next round because it's all about you and your province. We'll be back with another round of that issue. Alberta's election is underway, but as wildfires burn across the province, there are growing calls for the election to be delayed. That's next on The National. Welcome back to At Issue. Alberta's election campaign has a little more than two weeks left, but now wildfires are raging across the province. The military is being deployed to some of the danger zones in the province, as other people, thousands actually, have been evacuated. Alberta Elections says it is evaluating the conditions for voting per riding. We're just continuing to monitor the situation very closely. And we need to be able to decide if we can still offer voting locations. So for communities that have been evacuated, we're looking at where they've been evacuated to. Can we still offer voting services in the places that they've been evacuated to? So should Alberta consider postponing the election? And this is the critical, I think, political question. How can this kind of crisis affect a campaign? Let's bring in everyone. Chantal, Althea, Andrew, and Jason. Jason, this is why you're here. You can't have all the time, but you can certainly start us off. <laughs> uh, I mean, we saw uh, we saw everybody sort of suspend their campaigns at the beginning. Um, and, and certainly the premier is, is having to campaign and manage things. Um, is there a sense of, do you have a sense of how this could affect the campaign and, and how people are, are doing in it? It's hard to say. I mean, what this does give us a chance, and what, what it gives Danielle a chance is to show, Danielle Smith a chance, is to show how she can perform as premier in a crisis mode. Um, Alberta's had a lot of crisis modes, um, a lot of emergencies over time, uh, you know, going back to Rachel Notley uh, with the Fort McMurray fire in 2016, certainly Jason Kenney with the pandemic, and now Danielle Smith gets her first crisis. Um, and she's, you know, generally acting as a premier does um, in a time of crisis, uh, showing leadership, being responsive to questions, um, urging calm, urging people to uh, follow authorities, um, you know, pretty uh, ordinary things. Uh, interestingly, she uh, she uh, held a, an aud had an audience on Sunday with uh, Notley, her uh, now opposition leader, mm -hmm. uh, and they went out together in a nice uh, gesture during a campaign mm -hmm. uh, to meet some of the evacuees. Uh, in Edmonton, uh, it's going to be hard to say what kind of uh, you know what this does to the leader to the uh, yep. election, other than uh, suspending it a bit. Um, you know, one thing I would consider though is that the, not the whole province is on fire; it's in the no, north, right. um, north and around Edmonton, uh, sorry, <clears throat> west of Edmonton. Uh, in Calgary, we don't. We don't uh, feel the smoke. We don't sense it. So uh, it may not uh, wash over or impact us uh, as much down here. And of course, as you know, uh, Calgary is where most of the seats are and much of the battleground is. Yeah. Chantal. Well, uh, as you know, in this province, uh, Lucien Bouchard, when he was premier, went way up in the polls for his handling of an ice storm. That's right. So these events and the way they're handled, <coughs> and the reverse can also happen. Mm -hmm. A mayor of Montreal yeah. didn't show up when the city was flooded. Uh, and bad things happen. Uh, but I think on balance, I can't talk to the timing of the election, yeah. but uh, this crisis and the way it was handled by Danielle Smith uh, will probably in hindsight be seen as a plus uh, for her campaign rather than a minus. Althea? I don't know yet, because I think we're still kind of in the middle of it. I think sure. what it does raise is <clears throat> other issues, so like the news that actually, well, the news two years ago, three years ago, that the UCP had cut some of the elite forest fires uh, group for the, the guys who come down in the helicopters. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it kind of raises other issues that you don't expect to become political issues during a campaign, and that can go in all sorts of direction. But I do agree, I don't think anybody would agree otherwise, that it does give the candidate a chance to look very statesmanlike, 
uh, what they, how they would handle a crisis. And it's kind of ironic in a way that she is having this opportunity at the same time as uh, voters are also being reminded that if she was in the chair during the COVID-19 <clears throat> pandemic, the result would have been drastically different. So um, all of it speaks to trust. I wonder too, though, Andrew, if it, if it to, to Althea's point there, if it takes some of the focus off those other stories that probably would have been more prominent uh, in these days, because you, you, you have to ask the Premier some questions about how, how things are unfolding and her next steps, instead of uh, maybe asking just questions about things that, that are maybe deserving of many questions. Yeah, it's full of risks at the same time. You know, they could all go south on her in a hurry if, if she's seen not to care or if she's seen to be trying to exploit it or you right. know, a thousand other things. Politics is mm -hmm. performance art. Uh, these are moments when you have a chance to either put your foot right or put your foot wrong. Uh, and you know, the, how much the premier of the province actually is involved in or responsible for the details of, the, of, the, of fighting the fires is not great, but it's, they, they, they have to be sort of be seen in this, as I say, in this leadership slash performing role. Yeah. Um, but it's a delicate art. We saw this with that you know, very carefully staged meeting between her and Rachel Notley, where they both had to show up. They both had to profess to be putting Alberta first, mm -hmm. but they would be thinking throughout, you know, uh, how's the camera angle here? <laughs> so Jason, is there a sense uh, right now, I, I mean, the calls for postponing it are, uh, I mean, they're growing in the areas where, as you say, there are wildfires. Is there a sense whether that would benefit anyone, uh, either party in any way, and, and whether that, that is likely to happen at all? I'd say the likelihood seems low at this point. Um, right now, they're, you know, they've made some headways with the fires. Uh, some people are returning home, um, but it's, it's looking like it's going to be a lot of hot, dry in, uh, dry weather this, uh, you know, this this weekend. Yeah. Um, so who knows what can happen? I mean, having you know, ex you know, gone through uh, some of the many uh, wildfires that we keep seeing to be an increasing clip um, here in uh, in Alberta and the West, um, you know, it, it, two weeks is a long time. To go yeah. and um, will you know it's unlikely that evacuations um, would uh, may, would last that long necessarily. So people may be back, they may not be. Um, if anything is delayed, it would be in a few uh, few rural ridings um, west of Edmonton and north of Edmonton, and those ridings aren't in play. Um, so one of the scenarios that's been sketched out for us is maybe uh, if you know if two ridings um, have to have a postponed election um, or have remote voting and you know it's 43 42 um, then we don't know for maybe a few weeks or so uh, what the <laughs> result is but it's a pretty safe bet that if uh, if it's that tight and yeah. there are two ridings up and it's uh, those are UCP ridings but I think that's probably getting way ahead of ourselves at this point to okay, uh, sketch out I, those I'm fun not scenarios. I'm not I can't stay in Alberta more than like a week so I'm not going to be there to the very end <laughs> oh that's uh, <laughs> why you're so interested I just figured it out you are trying to the, um, answer the question. Yeah, I'm trying Should to anticipate how long I'll be trip? there. Let, well, yeah, let uh, me ask this question, though, about a serious question about whether the, the, this raises questions about climate change and whether that then becomes a factor during this campaign in a different way. Who wants in there, Chantal? Yes and no. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think, well, I'm not there. Jason can answer this better than I can. But I don't think uh, it, it, there is this sense that. Uh, it will tilt the balance of the election because right. suddenly climate change is uh, again being brought to the fore. Yeah. I, I would be surprised. Uh, Andrew? Well, and also everyone professes to believe in climate change. So it's always, yes, I believe in climate change, but yeah. uh, let's not do anything actually that would help to reduce emissions. Althea? Uh, oh. Uh, I don't. I don't actually think this is an issue at all, because yeah. we have forest fires in Alberta uh, every year. I think the issue is: Did the premier respond adequately, yeah. and do people feel like the resources were deployed quickly enough? Uh, I think that's where the conversation will turn. I don't think this is going to become a big debate about whether climate change exists or not. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jason, for uh, being here and offering your Calgary slash Alberta expertise. Appreciate it. With that, I'll send things back to Adrian in Toronto. You bet. Thanks, Rosie. Next, a moose makes a splash in our moment. What are you going to do when a moose stops by to take a bath, as they sometimes do? How do you tell it that the pool is closed? That is exactly what a New Brunswick family was asking themselves. The unexpected pool party is our moment.
I was not scared, but I was uh, surprised to see that in the pool. It was in the deepest side, about nine feet deep, and tried to get out, but was unable. It's a, a young cat, yeah. And if you see, you look at the, the video, you can see the mother on the other side. She was waiting for him. They tried to, to get it out with uh, different things, and uh, she started start to be angry. You can see it's flat in the water, and the moose was nervous. So after an hour and a half, I said to my husband, well, maybe it's better to not, not bother him, and he get out by himself. And it took the same way, the same way where he came from. <laughs> Hope he will not come again. Yeah. <laughs> I think the moose's mother probably gave him a bit of a talking to. Also, it's all fun and games until you realize the moose has cracked the pool liner and the people probably aren't getting into that until it is fixed. That is a national for May the 11th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.